Hey guys, welcome to topic 1.5, ratification of the United States Constitution for AP US government. In this lesson, you're going to learn about the compromises that were made during the Constitutional Convention and about the differences between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So after Shays' Rebellion, representatives from 12 of the 13 states came together in Philadelphia and made the decision that the Articles of Confederation needed to be replaced. This meant writing a whole new system of government, one in which there was a significantly stronger central government. But they still wanted to maintain a protection of individual liberties and state power. This led to three months of debate and compromise. So let's talk about some of the debates that came up during the deliberation of the Grand Committee, those 12 states that showed up to the convention, with Rhode Island choosing not to attend. The first thing the delegates had to contend with was how the legislature was going to be set up. How many representatives would each state get? Would it be equal or based on population? States with larger populations like Virginia pushed for having representation based on population with a bicameral or two-chambered legislature, as it would increase their power in that new legislature. Smaller states like New Jersey worried that they would get blocked out of decision-making with fewer representatives, and so backed a plan that would create a unicameral legislature with equal representation for each state. The representatives from the state of Connecticut came up with a compromise that would satisfy both small and large states. They came up with a bicameral or two-chambered legislature in which one chamber would be based on population, making large states happy, and the other would have equal representation, making small states happy. This is the basis of our current Congress. Once the setup for Congress had been decided, they then had to decide who would count towards the population in determining congressional representation. Specifically, they needed to decide whether or not they would count slaves. Southerners wanted to count slaves towards representation. This would give them an advantage in the House of Representatives. This did not mean that Southerners wanted slaves to vote. They just wanted to be able to use them to boost their numbers in Congress. In order to ensure that Southern states would not gain too much control over the House of Representatives, the two sides compromised to say that slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a free person. Think about that. In order to maintain balance in a congressional chamber, the framers relegated black slaves to have inherently less value than their white slave owners. We will talk more in class, but think about how the mindset of our country was affected by assigning less value to Blacks for the first 79 years of our history. The third debate that we're going to look at was whether or not the new government was going to continue to allow the importation of slaves from Africa. Many northern states were already beginning to abolish slavery, and to import more slaves seemed morally reprehensible to them. Southern states, however, argued that to have an immediate cessation of the importation of slaves, that they would, that, that would decimate their economy. Just stopping immediately was going to destroy their economy. This compromise gave southern states time. 20 years, in fact until 1808 to rework their economic systems to prepare for no new slaves to be imported. Congress could put a tax on each slave brought in, up to $10 per slave. The third debate that we're going to look at was whether or not the new government was going to continue to allow the importation of slaves from Africa. Many northern states were already beginning to abolish slavery, and to import more slaves seemed morally reprehensible to them. Southern states, however, argued that to have an immediate cessation, to immediately stop the importation of slaves, 
would decimate their economy. The compromise that they came up with was the Commerce and Slave Trade Compromise, which gave Southern states time, exactly 20 years or until 1808, to rework their economic systems to prepare for no new slaves to be imported. Congress could put a tax on each slave brought in, up to $10 per slave, or about $300 in today's money. This made sure that Congress couldn't tax the slave trade out of existence prior to 1808, though. During the 20 years between the writing of the Constitution and 1808, the importation of slaves became wildly unpopular, and Congress passed the Act for Prohibiting the Import of Slaves in 1807, which went into effect immediately on January 1st of 1808. The framers knew that they needed an executive, but many were still fearful of that executive holding too much power. Many in the Grand Committee feared that a president would appeal directly to the public, that the public would be unable to be truly informed about candidates, especially in rural areas. Another group in, in the Grand Committee feared that the legislature choosing the feared the legislature choosing the president, making it too easy for the president and the legislature to get too comfortable with one another. So they compromised on presidential elections, creating a temporary independent group who would directly vote on the president. We call that group today the Electoral College, and it is a state-based solution that serves as a safeguard against the population. And we'll talk about the Electoral College more in class. So that was it. That was the end. And everybody celebrated. Okay, well, maybe not so much. <laughs> While there was a large group of people who ra wanted to ratify the Constitution called the Federalists, another group emerged, which included even some members of the Grand Committee. And they thought that the Constitution gave the federal government too much power. They called themselves the Anti-Federalists, and they actively worked to prevent the Constitution from being ratified. Eventually, they agreed to the new Constitution, but they had to have one major demand met. So let's look at what these two groups believed. Federalists, including Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, fought to get states to ratify the new constitution. They wrote a series of 85 essays that were published in newspapers that discussed almost every part of the new constitution and explained why it was the best way forward for the country. Now, you might want to pause the video here so that you can get all of the beliefs of these federalists down in your notes. Go ahead and do that now. Anti-Federalists, which included signers of the Declaration of Independence, Robert Yates and Patrick Henry, fought against the new constitution, feeling it gave the central government too much power. They eventually grew, agreed to vote to ratify on the condition that Congress would immediately add protections for individual liberties listed in the Bill of Rights. Now, pause here so that you can get the beliefs of the Anti-Federalists down in your notes. Go ahead and do that now. One of the things the framers were able to build into the Constitution in Article 5 was the amendment process. If you remember in the Articles of Confederation, the entire legislative body had to unanimously agree to any changes in the Articles. Considering they couldn't even get Rhode Island to show up to the convention in Philadelphia, it was unlikely that they were ever going to get a unanimous vote. The Constitution, however, sets up a process that allows both the states and Congress to have a say in the amending process. It's a two-step process. The first step is to get a two-thirds majority of either both chambers of Congress or two-thirds of the state legislatures to propose the amendment. The second step is to get three quarters of either state legislatures or state conventions to ratify that change. 
While the framers did their best to answer as many of the questions as they could directly in the Constitution, the reality is that much of the Constitution is flexible and up for interpretation. The debate over the role of the central government continues even today, as we see it in questions over government surveillance and the role that the government, the federal government plays in education. So, in this lesson, you should have learned about the compromises made during the Constitutional Convention and about the differences between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. If there was anything you missed in this video, please go back now and re-watch the portions of the video that you need to. Then, go ahead and answer the summarizing question in your notes so that you can get a stamp the next time we're in class. Alright guys, we'll see you next time. Bye!